playing Monster Hunter World for Digital Foundry's coverage of the PC version, I found myself rather stumped at the game's performance scaling. Some settings either sacrificed too much visual fidelity, or they had too little effect on performance in moments with a very specific type of GPU load. Like when transparency showed up on screen and decided to tank the frame rate even with optimized settings in place. Thankfully though, we had an ace up our sleeves as Monster Hunter World offers a dynamic resolution option. And with this setting, we could clear up most of the dramatic drops in frame rate and keep our desired visual settings in place. But even then, it was somehow imperfect. There were still dips in frame rate there, in specifically GPU heavy moments. Tiny stutters as the frame rate dropped and then settled over time, which begs the question, why was the game's dynamic resolution even doing this? With that imperfection bothering me, I thought it was about time to dedicate a video entirely to dynamic resolution, especially as it is becoming more and more common to see in PC titles. So how does this dynamic resolution really work, and what makes up the perfect implementation? But before we talk about what makes up a good implementation, I really think we need to talk about the technical considerations behind dynamic resolution as a whole. The method behind dynamic resolution is pretty simple. The time it takes to render out a frame on a GPU is proportional to the resolution that it is rendering out at. Presuming that a GPU has sufficient memory bandwidth and there are no other bottlenecks, a 4K image having 4 times the pixel as a 1080p image will take 4 times as long to render out. So if you have a GPU rendering a 1080p frame out and it took 8.3 milliseconds, or at around 120 FPS, it would then take around 33.3 milliseconds to render that frame out at 4K, or 30 FPS. That general assumption is the paradigm upon which dynamic resolution works. So if we want to save performance in scenes with varying levels of load, without dropping other settings or the quality of the pixel shading itself, we could scale down resolution to decrease that render time. Say we are starting at a 4K resolution with our previous example here, running at 33.3 milliseconds, but we wanted that exact same shot to be running at 60 FPS instead of 30. To render out that same shot in 16.6 milliseconds, we would have to half the total pixel count to achieve that goal, thus to around 2715 by 1527 or so if we follow Nvidia's DSR resolution set. But that is just a linear scale on both axes. You could also technically just scale down one of the axes to achieve that same total drop in resolution. So instead of 2715 by 1527, you could perhaps see 1920 by 2160. Looking at that, you really might imagine that the image would look stretched. But no worries, the pixels themselves are rendered out with the proper aspect ratio taken into account, so it still has proper proportions. That is a rather extreme difference in resolution though for one axis, but it may not necessarily always look so extreme in practice. The idea of scaling only one axis is based upon the notion that your mind's eye may find resolution drops on just one axis less noticeable than on both. Take a look here at this scene in Wolfenstein the New Colossus. First, at each axis scaled at 0.75 of 1080p, or or 1440 by 810. Then here, switched around to 0.56 scaling on the horizontal axis to achieve roughly the same total amount of pixels. Which one do you find more aesthetically pleasing? Or better yet, which one do you find less intrusive? The more horizontal or vertical lines a game has in its art makes the effect of changing the resolution on each axis different. Let's come back to TNC here. When reducing the horizontal resolution, the vertical lines become more jagged. And when reducing the vertical resolution, the horizontal lines become more jagged. In a less extreme example with less scaling, scaling a single axis can be nigh imperceptible. A great example here is Doom 2016 on the PS4, which reduces its resolution to 0.9 on the horizontal axis in times of high GPU load to hit that ever so crucial 60 FPS. That makes the resolution at those times 1728 by 1080. Here's how that same resolution drops looks illustrated in TNC. How does that difference look to you? If the difference between these two images here meant getting a fluid, synced 60fps or stuttering 58fps, I think you can see why this is done. A core reason why the difference between the two shots is not as noticeable as you might have thought is due to the prevalence of temporal super sample anti-aliasing in many titles these days. As described in the Tech Focus video on anti-aliasing, temporal supersampling is essentially smoothing jagged edges with information from previous frames. Without it, the internal resolution of an image becomes much more apparent. Check out the difference here in TNC, which is rather huge. 
At 0.5 resolution scaling on both axes without TAA, the game looks like a jagged mess with pixel edges being extremely obvious. By using the game's 8x temporal super sample anti-aliasing option, the added visual information and smoothing of those pixels makes the game have a softer look with far less aliasing, thus making the internal resolution itself much less obvious. Even with TAA though, honestly, such a massive drop such as halving resolution on both axes is probably going to catch your eye, even if it is just a momentary blip in the gameplay. So just scaling the resolution arbitrary to any number in an instant to keep up the frame rate is not the only factor which makes up dynamic resolution. It is not always the case of course, but a number of games have had a lower limit for resolutions which the game can drop to. For example, on PC here, Assassin's Creed Origins in our testing limits the lowest resolution to around 1600 by 900 or nearly 83.3% on each axis with its dynamic resolution scaling option. So the game limits the minimum resolution it can drop here to make its dynamic resolution in the end less obvious and in practice really it's hard to see. Running around the streets of Alexandria here saw my trained eye having a really hard time picking out those moments when resolution was dropping in motion. But at the same time since it is not dropping resolution as much as it theoretically could to maintain frame rate, the game will still have GPU related frame drops below the target, in this case 60 FPS. Then you have the opposite side of the spectrum here, where a game's resolution scaler will scale the resolution no matter what based upon your frame rate target. Like here in Titanfall 2. This fast paced game with extremely low latency controls offers an incredibly functional dynamic resolution setting on PC, where you can arbitrarily change the FPS target. When targeting the ever more common refresh rate of 144 FPS on PC, we could see the game fluctuating wildly just when turning the camera on an underclocked GTX 1070 to accentuate those drops. Being 1080p in some instances, 960 by 540 in others, or 1536 by 864. And this is all just by spinning in a circle. Such radical changes in resolution are done to maintain that FPS target, and presumably always done with enough headroom to spare to account for variability of load within the next frame. If a dynamic resolution system were just to target that desired frame rate, say 16.6 milliseconds per frame, then it would actually often be dropping frames if a game has scenes with variable load, such as when an explosion happens near the camera or all of a sudden there's a lot of vegetation in the window view. Due to this type of variability in games, that internal target for frame time at which point the resolution will start dropping is actually often below the actual frame time target, say 14 milliseconds or 72 FPS for a game targeting 60. This is commonly known as headroom and is always considered in games even in those without dynamic resolution, such as Killer Instinct on the base Xbox One, which internally targets around 90 FPS to account for those scenarios where there's more GPU load. Having this headroom means resolution is already low enough in most scenarios to account for moments of increased load. And this is probably one of the reasons why Titanfall 2's dynamic resolution setting manages to maintain such a rock solid frame rate. And now here's where things get really interesting, as that is not the only reason why a game like Titanfall 2's dynamic resolution scaler keeps FPS so steady. There are other factors still to be taken into account for dynamic resolution in games. The amount of resolution that is incrementally dropped each frame to reach that targeted render time is also extremely important. In the case of Monster Hunter World, this is why we end up seeing those momentary blips in frame rate even with dynamic resolution being on. The internal engine values for how much resolution it can drop per frame and what the internal render time is that it targets for 60 FPS is not very aggressive. This makes the resolution drop more slowly over time instead of being instantaneous. So in general it takes a few frames for the resolution to drop enough to stabilize that frame rate. Being more gradual makes the individual difference between frames less apparent so you notice the scaling less. When Monster Hunter World eventually gets down to that proper resolution over a few frames, the amount scaled downward is perfectly proportionate to the amount needed to get that frame rendering out. Id Tech 6 offers similar functions internally with developers having separate controls to change how much the resolution drops over how many frames, on which axis, and how many frames it takes to start increasing that resolution again in specified increments. Using these type of functions with differing minimum resolution amounts, id and Machine Games have set up two different types of dynamic resolution modes on Xbox One X and PS4 Pro. So when it originally launched, the dynamic resolution option saw less constant scaling and lower incremented values below the target resolution of 4K or 1440p. So its resolution was more stable at the cost of a less stable frame rate. 
Then they added an aggressive scaling option down the line, which lowered the frame time render target and increased the rapidity with which the resolution itself could drop with a lower resolution floor. This aggressive resolution option clears up more of the frame rate drops on Xbox One X, but makes the differences in resolution more immediate and more dramatic. So there you have it. A lot of technical facets make up the design behind dynamic resolution in games. There are settings for which axis drops resolution, the minimum amount of resolution either axis can drop to, the internal target frame rate for resolution drops above the real target frame rate, or headroom, the amount of resolution dropped or raised in increments, and how many frames it takes for the resolution increments to drop or increase upon recovery. And these are just the basic runtime values that I've encountered in games in my experience. There are presumably even more custom parameters that developers use to fit the specific requirements of their game. It sounds pretty amazing, right? Well, it sure is. With the right values and the right settings, resolution drops can be nigh imperceptible while keeping the frame rate up to what you expect. Especially with some good temporal super sampling added into the mix and with higher base resolutions like 4K. Even then, dynamic resolution is not a panacea for curing all frame rate related problems in games. For example, in all those cases where there's some other factor than the GPU limiting performance, dropping resolution will have little to no effect on the frame rate. Take Assassin's Creed Origins here. Even with the resolution dropping to 1600 by 900 and the GPU utilization being reasonably below 100, we are still seeing frame rate drops below 60 FPS in Alexandria here. This game's open world in this town really hammers CPUs and the PC's ability to stream in new assets in and out of memory, so dropping resolution here doesn't have a great effect on performance. Even regarding the GPU itself, dropping resolution does not necessarily always help as much as you imagine it could. For example, here in the classic heaven benchmark from Unigen, with tessellation set to extreme, the relative performance delta between 4K and 1080p on an RX 580 is much lessened. Dropping resolution is more effective at increasing performance with tessellation set to off. Here in this case, we're seeing this difference because bottlenecking is occurring within the GPU itself, as those parts of the GPU utilized in rendering during tessellation are over encumbered so to speak. In this, the GPU is hindered from getting a more perfect utilization and scaling normally with resolution, so you see less return when dropping the resolution with tessellation being set to on. This is a rather extreme scenario with this GPU, but it applies to all GPUs to some degree. Certain effects, shaders, or elements on screen will make resolution scaling more or less effective on different GPUs. Really though, and in spite of its limitations, dynamic resolution is an incredibly powerful tool in the hands of the player or the developer to tailor a game's performance and visuals to their liking. This is why I think more games need to start implementing it as an option. And to make it most perfect, dynamic resolution modes need to offer users a freedom of choice. In the most perfect scenario, I would ask for all those values which make up its internal mechanisms to be exposed to the user in the options menu. Honestly though, unless you love tweaking as much as I do, not everyone's gonna want to do this or even know how to utilize these settings in the first place. So beyond this, I think developers could have more simplified choices with similar effects. The most simplified of settings would be a dynamic resolution resolution mode which looks at your FPS cap or refresh rate, say 30, 50, 60, 120, and offers you a choice of how aggressive dynamic resolution should be to maintain that FPS cap. Kind of like TNC on consoles, but with a low, medium, and high amount perhaps for the amount of resolution scaling. A more complex but still readily understandable dynamic resolution could be done by combining the design principles of the dynamic resolution found in Gears of War 4 PC and that found in Titanfall 2. In Gears of War 4 PC, you can choose how far below your chosen resolution the game is able to scale, with you being able to dynamically super sample above your native resolution by utilizing downsample resolutions in the menu, like here, by changing the percentage. If you were to then combine this with the ability to target completely arbitrary frame rates like in Titanfall 2, you would then have two sliders covering almost every preference regarding how dynamic resolution would work and how aggressive it could be just by having the user control the upper and lower bounds of resolution and frame rate. In the end, offering choice is a key, just like your choice to watch this video, which I really hope you enjoyed and found informative. If you did like it, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you are already a subscriber, consider hitting that little bell button in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you want to talk about dynamic resolution and your thoughts on it, write a comment below or follow me and Digital Foundry on Twitter. As always, this is Alex, bidding you farewell und auf Wiedersehen!